Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. First Peter chapter 3, the part of the chapter I'm going to be focusing on is starting in verse number 14. Bible reads, but, but and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. And the subject matter I'm going to be preaching on this morning is being ready. Being ready. That verse 15 says that we need to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. See, and, and in the verse before and the verse after that, it's talking about being persecuted. It's talking about people persecuting it says, if you suffer for righteousness sake, if you suffer because you're trying to live a righteous life, because you hold to the views of the Bible, you say, no, this is wrong. This is a sin. For example, which is real popular, or not popular, but common today, I guess you could say, is, you know, P Christians who stand by the Bible that say homosexuality is an abomination. God hates it. It deserves the death penalty, according to the Bible, that this is something that in today's society, if you just, just say that, they know you're a Christian, and you know what, I just believe every word of God, this is what God's word says, and I believe it, you will get attacked, and you will get persecuted. And hey, the Bible says, if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Don't be afraid of their terror. Don't be afraid of them, you know, calling you all kinds of names and bigots and, and hateful, hate monger, all these other things that they like to throw out at you. And, and try to demean you and terrorize you just because you believe what the Word of God says. And it's in black and white. I mean, it couldn't be any more clear how wicked, you know, different sins are. Adultery is another one. I mean, there's lots of sins, but the one that's the most, that seems to be hitting the headlines the most these days is the homosexuality because it's been so accepted in our culture and our society that you will, you know, people will come down on you very hard. The world will attack you if you hold to these positions and people know that and of course we are lights to lights to shine in this world that people ought to know where we stand on things especially these important issues but he says you need to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a question of the hope that is in you so as you're being persecuted you ought to be able to defend your position from the scripture from the word of, word of God now Everybody's in various stages of growth as a Christian. You learn different things, and not everyone's always able to turn to the, to the chapter and verse and say, see, the Bible says exactly right here, but that's what we are supposed to be able to do. You may not be there yet, but we need to be ready. You need to be ready. The more you learn, the more you grow, you need to be ready when people ask you, well, why do you say, why do you believe that? Why do you think homosexuality is a sin? Why do you think it's so bad? I mean, the Bible says we're all sinners anyways, or why do you think that's so bad? Be ready. And that's just, I mean, obviously, that's just one issue, one topic I'm bringing up. There's lots of issues, there's lots of things that, that we believe that the Bible preaches and teaches. There's a lot of things the Bible teaches that are not common, that are not popular today, that people will look at you maybe sometimes like you have two heads. You know, I mean, we, well, for example, we started off reading this chapter and it says in verse 1, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. That's not, that's not popular today. That's not popular preaching. That's, that's something that, you know, with, with the women's lib and, and everything else, it's no, no, no. You, you know, it's, it's equal. You know, the, the woman has the same voice as the man and that you are both in charge of, you know, that's not the way that the Bible says it. The Bible says, let the woman, the wife be in subjection to her own husband. That's what God's Word says. And I'm not ashamed of God's Word. God knows what's right better than, than the, the liberal world out there will try to tell you that, about what's right and wrong. I'm going to stick with God's Word. He knows what's right. But see, it's one thing to say, well, yeah, I think the man should be the head of the household. But when people challenge you and say, well, why? Why do you believe that? We ought to be ready to give an answer and say, well... Because in 1 Peter chapter 3, God's word tells us, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. 
Now, what I'm probably going to be focusing the most on today, there's a lot of issues, there's a lot of doctrine that we ought to be ready to defend. And, and you know, here's the reason why we ought to, one of the reasons, besides that the Bible tells us that we ought to be ready, is that when you're not able to articulate a good reason, people will just automatically think you're ignorant. They'll think you're brainwashed. They'll think you're stupid. And just, oh, that's just another one of those bigoted Christians. Because maybe you're not able to give an answer, right? And, and people will tell you, and, and I just saw someone put up a video on Facebook yesterday, and I don't know, it was some clip from a TV show or a movie or something. And I've seen these arguments all the time. You have the people that hate God, like the people that are running Hollywood that are actually producing this stuff, have this, oh, but the Bible says, you know, I started off saying, you know, the Bible says that it, it condones selling your daughter into slavery. And they'll, and they'll quote like a chapter and verse and they'll say, and what about this and what about that? And what about, you know, like they, they try to mock God's word as if it's just completely ridiculous. And most of the time they're just completely way off base. They'll say, oh, so you're supposed to kill a disobedient child? And I'm not going to get into all, I've done this in sermons in the past where we go through these passages that they like to take and just butcher them up to try to make them say something they don't. But in that particular passage, it talks about, you know, a son who's a drunkard, a glutton, a wine bibber, and he's not listening to what his parents say. Obviously, if someone's a drunkard, they're not like five years old. You know, it's not talking about a little child that needs to be disciplined. It's talking about someone who's grown that's just completely rebellious against their parents and is doing nothing that those children are, were given, the, you know, the law was given that they should be put to death. And if you, if you were to hit your parents, like, you know, your son grows up and were to, to, to actually punch like your, your mother or father, that was the death penalty. And that's pretty serious. It's severe, but that's the way that God viewed the respect that you need to have for your parents. There's a lot of reasoning behind this. It's not just all stupidity, right? People just say like, oh yeah, I can't. you think that's a just point? Look, it's what the Bible says. But see, they'll take that and say, oh yeah, so like, you know, if, if what little kid doesn't disobey, so you're just going to be putting all the kids to death. And they take that and run with it. And they try to make you look stupid. They try to make God's word look stupid and, and ridiculous. Or like in, uh, um, what was it one or two weeks ago, I showed you what the NIV said about, about um, in Deuteronomy. The NIV and other false perversions of the Bible will tell you that if a woman is raped, that the man that rapes her needs to marry that person. If she's unmarried and she's raped, that they need to get married. That's what the NIV says, but that's not what the King James Bible says. And that's false. But see, that, those are the types of things that people will bring out and say, you know, try to say why the Bible is so stupid. And why God's, you know, and why you're so ignorant to believe God's word for anything. But if you're ready to give an answer, and the clip that they show, this one I'm thinking of, where the guy just kind of went on this little rant of, of trying to quote all these different verses, the woman that he was talking to had no answer for him. Now, he is a fool. I'm not saying he necessarily even deserves an answer, but we ought to be ready to give an answer to defend God's word and be like, you're completely false. You're, you're completely misquoting the Bible, misstating the Bible, and what you're saying is not true. And I'll show you that this is exactly what the Bible says, and you could get into it that way. We ought to be ready to defend God's word. But not only that, you know, when we look at this verse closely, it says, to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is in you. Now, why do we have hope? We have hope because we know that our, that our sins have been forgiven. We have hope that we are going to make it to heaven one day. We have hope in our salvation. We have hope in Jesus Christ. And that is one thing that, that without fail, we all have to be ready to give an answer about. Why? Why do you know? Why are you going to heaven? Why do you have this hope? Why do you think that when you die, you're going to heaven? Why? We ought to be able to explain that and use scripture to support that. We need to be ready. There's lots of areas we need to be ready. Let's turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles chapter 12. 2 Chronicles in the Old Testament. There's a lot of big books. If you go kind of, I don't know, I want to say like 
halfway between the, uh, Genesis and Psalms, you're going to have 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and then 1st and 2nd Chronicles. When you find any of those books, you're, you're getting close. We're going to be in 2nd Chronicles and chapter 12. So we need to be ready. We need to be ready to have an answer. Now, how are you going to be ready to have that answer? Well, what, the, the best way, I mean, there's, there's multiple ways. One way is to come to church and to learn more and more about the Bible, help get some more teaching. But probably even more important than that is just reading the Bible on your own, finding these scriptures, actually thinking about them, studying them, and keeping them in your heart, keeping them with you. Or maybe keeping a Bible with you. If you're ready to give an answer, you're ready. I mean, what does it mean to be ready? You're, you're prepared. You're ready to go, right? There's lots of ways we can get ready. We're going to see in 2 Chronicles here that it's going to, it starts off, we need to get our hearts prepared. Everything else will follow after that. Our heart needs to be, if, if your heart's not in it, none of this stuff is going to matter to you and you're not going to be prepared. You're not going to be ready to give, to give an answer to every man because if, if your heart's not even right, if your heart's not prepared and ready to serve God, ready to learn, ready to do what's right, ready to come to church, do all these things, then none of it's going to follow through. It all has to start inside you individually to get your heart right and, and, and to, to, to get that desire to serve God. Girls, sit forward, sit straight. 2 Chronicles chapter 12. Verse number 13, the Bible reads, So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. So we see here, this is Rehoboam. He's the son of Solomon. We had King David, then King Solomon reigned. And then Solomon, near the end of his life, turned, you know, turned away from God. He, he, he had all these strange wives. He had you know, 700 wives and 300 concubines. And he built these altars unto false gods that they worshipped because he married these heathen women that God told him he was not supposed to do. And the king's not supposed to multiply wives, but he disobeyed that. And his heart was turned away from the Lord. And, and he built up these, these altars unto false gods. And because of that, God took the kingdom away from, from the house of David, except for one tribe. He basically left Judah there for them to reign over just because of David's sake, because David was such a righteous, godly man, and that God wanted to keep his promise to David that, that he says, okay, well, the rest of the kingdom is being taken away from you. And Rehoboam was Solomon's son. And Rehoboam here, it says he was the son of an Ammonitus. And again, Ammon was was one of the heathen people that was in that land at that time but it says here that he ended up doing evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the lord when we aren't in the right mindset when we don't have our hearts ready to serve god we're going to end up doing evil we're going to end up doing wrong we're going to end up scattering instead of gathering as we saw last week getting in church and listening to a man of God, preach hard is going to help you, you to get prepared. It's going to help your heart to be right. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament. Luke chapter 1. Of all the things of preparedness and getting ready, there's not much that I can do for you to get your heart ready with God. Like That's something that's internal. That's something individual. You have to decide for yourself how much you love God, how much you want to serve Him, and how much you want to get your heart right. I can just show you the, you know, the passages in the Bible and try to exhort you and try to say, you know, come on, let's, let's all be good children of God. He's given us this free gift. Let's show our thanks to Him. Let's show how much we love Him by serving Him and doing what He wants us to do. But you have to have that, the, your heart right with Him and not have this, you know, the, the children of Israel read all throughout the Old Testament, they had this stiff neck. And, and these hard hearts where they just didn't, you know, God was telling them what to do and they just didn't want to do what he had them to do. And they were continually just disobeying, being rebellious, and being stubborn 
when God would tell him to do things. And God would just tell him, look, I just want you to obey me. I just want you to have faith in me. I just want you to trust me. I just want, you know, this is what I'm telling you to do. Just, just you know, with, with, with almost every aspect of their lives. And they made their lives much more difficult. They wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. You know, as a result of their stiff-neckedness and hard-heartedness, their life became much more difficult. All the more reason for us to get our hearts ready and right to serve God. Because if it's not right, we're making our lives very difficult. Rehoboam's life was not easy. He, he did evil, and guess what? We're going to reap everything that we sow. So if you want to do what's wrong, and you want to do wicked, and you want to have a hard heart against God, and say, you know what, God, instead of going to church, I'm just going to sleep, or I'm just going to go do this other thing. Instead of reading the Bible, I'm going to do these other things, and just put off God's word and serving Him. It'll come back to us. But here in Luke chapter 1, we see here, over and over again in the New Testament, you know, even when Jesus came, things had to be prepared for him to come. And that's why John the Baptist was sent. John the Baptist was sent to come and prepare the way of the Lord. He came to get things ready for Jesus Christ to come in and start his ministry. In Luke 1 verse 17, it says, the Bible reads, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John the Baptist was the one that came in. It says here, in the spirit and the power of Elijah. That's who Elias is. It's Elijah. And if you know anything about Elijah from the Old Testament, he was, he was kind of a hard preaching type of guy. He didn't, you know, he... Um, a lot, a lot of people, you know, we have this false idea of what preachers are like. And when you read the Old Testament, you're going to see some really, really tough, hard guys that are preaching God's word. For example, Samuel. Samuel, you may not know this, ended up killing some of the kings that Saul didn't kill when he was supposed to have done it. Hush your mouth right now. Samuel himself killed some people that, that were supposed to be killed by Saul. He killed the king um, that, that God had told Saul to go and wipe out an entire country, to you know, wipe out all the people and don't, you know, don't leave anything. And when Saul went, they came back with some of the best of the, of the cattle to offer up as sacrifices and they didn't kill the king. And Samuel came. He's like, what are you doing? You know, this is what God commanded you to do. What are you doing? So Samuel had to go over there and himself just physically kill the king. And this is a preacher. This is a man of God. It's a priest of God. Um, Elijah was another one. Same thing. He had all the, the when uh, he was, Elijah was the one that was offering up. He said, we're going to see who God really is. He says, let's get all, all the prophets of Baal together. And because Elijah felt very alone because no one was really serving the Lord and he, it didn't seem to him like anybody was at all. And there's all these false prophets out there. And he says, we're going to we're going to make this right right now. You get your bowl and you dress it, but you can't put any fire under it. And you do whatever it is you need to do. Call on the name of your God. And he says, the God that answers by fire is God. So they're they're over there. They're cutting themselves. They're chanting. They're jumping up and down. They're doing all this stuff. And of course, they're serving a God that is not God, that is not a real God at all, so everything they're doing is in vain. And then Elijah finally says, okay, at the time of the evening sacrifice, he says, he builds up the altar to the Lord, and he, he you know, kills the, he, he dresses the, the bullock, and he puts it out, you know, cuts it up, and then he says, all right, let's get some water. And he dumps a bunch of water, he digs a trench, he dumps all kinds of water, just douses it douses the wood, douses the animal with water, and the trench is filled up with water. And then, you know, he prays unto God, and boom, and as everything is just, the fire just comes down and devours the whole sacrifice, and all the water that's around the trench, all of it gets just, just licked up, it says. And it is an amazing thing. But after that event, Elijah says, okay, let's take up the, the prophets of Baal and kill them. These were two men of God that, I mean, that people, you don't hear this stuff. You don't think that way. You think, you know, this, the culture and society and the world's going to teach you that, you know, Jesus was this long-haired, you know, pacifist, 
Everything he said was real soft-spoken and mild-mannered. But that's not what the Bible teaches at all. The Bible teaches, when, when, when Jesus asked his disciples, he says, who do men say that I am? And the disciples say, well, some people think you're Jeremiah, some people think you're Elijah, some people think you know, you're these prophets from the Old Testament. Well, we read the stories of these prophets in the Old Testament. They were pretty tough guys. They were pretty hard guys. They were not just these, these fruitcake, pushover, you know, namby-pamby type of, of men that, that are real just just soft-spoken and pacifist. I mean, you remember even Jesus Christ made a whip and drove the people out of the temple when, they, when the money changed. I mean, he flipped over the tables and he took a whip and just started driving people out. He was not this image that Hollywood will put out, that, that these paintings and these pictures put out. Now, it doesn't mean he's without compassion or without love or without mercy or any of these things because, of course, he had great compassion. But he's not this sissy of a man either. I mean, the Bible says it's a sin to be effeminate. And most of the, the, the images that you'll see that people put out there of Jesus Christ is an effeminate looking man. And that's a sin. And Jesus Christ was not a sinner. How did I get off on all of this? <laughs> Preparing our hearts for the Lord. That's where it came from. John the Baptist was just like these other men, like Elijah. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. He came, like these guys came, to prepare the people for the coming of Jesus Christ. One of the ways that we can get our hearts ready is by getting into a church where you have a man of God who's not this effeminate person, who's just real soft-spoken, but someone that can, that can prepare your, help you get your heart prepared for Jesus Christ by preaching the way that these people did, by teaching the things that they taught because they're in the Holy Scripture, by, by getting you ready the way that John the Baptist was getting the people ready for Jesus. These are all things, you know, and what happens, there's a lot of power, there's conviction in the preaching. There's, you know, the, the Bible says, to, you know, in Isaiah to, you know, to, to, to preach and to teach, the, to show the people their sins. He says, cry aloud. He says, uh, spare not to the preacher. This is what you need to do. You need to cry out against this stuff. You don't need to hold back. Spare not. He says, you know, stamp your foot, you know, whatever it takes. Get these people to understand their sins, that this is a big deal, that this isn't something you just look over. We need this type of, of preaching and, and listening to this stuff. You know, I needed it. Grow, as I started to grow in the Lord, I still need it. This isn't something that I'm just above and beyond. We continue to need these things. They need to be brought down to our level and we need to, to it's, a, it's a combat against what the world is trying to throw at you. It's, it's a counterbalance. And it needs to be just, you know, sometimes just in your face, just like, look, this is, you know, wake up. You know, you're, you're sinning. You got, you got to get right with God. We got to get ourselves right. And that'll help you to get your heart prepared and, and just get prepared in general for the Lord. Turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Being ready to serve God, part of getting ready to serve God is going to be getting the sin out of our life. We need to be a vessel. You know, God has bought us with a price. He's bought us with the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We belong to Him. We are not our own. He has a work for us to do. And in order for him to use us, we need to be a vessel that's, that's sanctified, that's, that's ready for him to use. God can use anybody to do his will, but I'll tell you right now that the people who are listening to him the most and, 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 and cleaning up their life the most are going to get used of God the most. He can use anyone. 
No matter where you're at, just say, you know what, I just have all kinds of sin in my life. Look, God can still use you. Don't ever think that God just can't use me so that I'm just going to give up and just say, well, whatever, because what's God going to do with me? God can use you no matter where you're at. God can use you to, to preach the gospel to somebody else to get them saved. But he's not going to be able to use you in the same capacity if you decide to just, to just stay where you're at and not get any of the sin out of your life. If you want to get greatly used of God, I mean, look at the great men of the Bible that did a lot for God. None of these people were, are, are seen as just being like continually just always in sin and just everything else. Now, did they all have their problems? Yes, they all are human and they all had sin like we all do. But they weren't just like these drunkards that are just always, you know, continually just, just in sin or whatever. I mean, again, pick the sin. I, I, it doesn't matter if you just have this, this habitual lifestyle of just, of just not getting right with God, not caring, not listening, not reading your Bible, not, you know, not going to church. God's not going to use you. You may be saved, yeah, but God's not going to use you the way that he used all these other people. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. And ultimately, that's what matters. You know, we talk about being ready. I talk about getting the sin out of your life. It's not so much so you can look good in front of, it's not at all so you can look good in front of other people. When the Bible says here, do you study to show yourself approved unto God? Everything that we do, we're getting, we're trying to get God's approval. Which is even better because if we're trying to get man's approval, guess what? The standard is going to be a lot lower. God sets the standard really high. So if we're going to try to, to, to be approved unto God, then our standard needs to be very high for ourselves. We need to try to, to, to gauge ourselves against God's holy word. So it says here, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So he's talking about two types of people. So you know what? Some, there's some people that, that are there, to, they're going to honor and glorify God, and some people that don't. And he was referring up a little bit earlier about people who are speaking profane and vain babblings and he names Hymenaeus and Philetus and he says look if you're listening to these guys it's just going to increase unto more ungodliness we need to stay away from that false doctrine and these false teachings the profane and vain babblings and we ought to be vessels unto honor not unto dishonor so if we purge ourselves from the false prophets if we purge ourselves from our own evil, wicked works, then we will be a vessel unto honor. And it says sanctified and meet for the master's use. That means we're ready for God to use us. Prepared unto every good work. Verse 22 then continues on being prepared to every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. So it's saying flee these youthful lusts, the lusts of your flesh that's going to drive you into sin. We need to get away from that in order to be greatly used of God. We need to be more concerned with being righteous, doing what's right, having faith, having charity where you're concerned about other people. You have this love to help other people peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure, pure heart. This is how we get ready and we're able to be used of God. Now, I'm going to focus on being prepared and ready to give the gospel to someone because this is something that's going to be very relevant to all of our lives individually. And, you know, I, I go on and on about sin sometimes, but this is what I want to make sure that everybody in this room is ready to do. 
There are opportunities that arise sometimes to give the gospel to people. If that opportunity were to arise for you, let's say there's someone that you really cared about and you know, for a long time you've been separated by distance or, or whatever, you haven't talked to each other in years, but now all of a sudden that opportunity just falls in your lap. You have alone time with a person that you love and maybe you know that there's, you know, it may be the only time you're going to have to ever get to talk to this person about Jesus Christ and about being saved. Are you ready? Would you be ready to give the gospel to that person? Opportunities to give the gospel come up when you least expect it sometimes. Now, obviously, we go out at regular times, regular intervals, we go out so and we preach the gospel to every creature. But sometimes opportunities arise. We need to make sure that we're always ready, not just when we go out to someone's door. When we go out to someone's door, you, you prepared, you know, we pray before we go out, we bring our Bibles with us, you know, you, you can look things over and you're ready to go and you're prepared. But we want to be prepared more than just right before you go out. We need to be prepared all the time. So what are some ways that we could be prepared? Well, one is having a Bible with you. Right? I mean, if, if, if you don't have, and, and that could be multiple ways that you have a Bible with you. You can have a physical book, right? The Bible, like I'm holding in my hand. But it, these days, even with technology, it's so much easier. We were talking about this before service. You can have a Bible on your phone. So if you, if you have your phone with you, you can make sure you have the Bible with you also at, at, you know, at all times. But even a better way than, than, than carrying the book or having it on your phone is to have it right here. If you have Bible verses right here, you are ready to quote God's word and to, to get somebody the gospel no matter where you are. There are instances where I've forgotten my phone. There are times when I may not have a Bible handy. Now, I'll tell you what, I, as far as the Bible goes, I have Bibles in my car. I have Bibles in just about every room of my house. I usually have a pocket Bible. I don't today, but I have a little pocket New Testament that I carry in my pocket. These are things, steps that I've taken to make sure that I'm ready. Sometimes you may end up somewhere stuck. You know, you go to, a, go to an appointment and you're stuck. You know, there's times then to, to read the Bible. There's times to do things that are going to be good for you, that are going to help you to be ready to be used of God. But giving the, the, the gospel, if you have a Bible with you, if you have more importantly even the scriptures memorized, even if it's just like one or two verses, hey, you're getting yourself ready. Now I have a bunch of verses memorized. Every verse that I use to give the gospel to people, I have memorized. But you start with one. Start with John 3.16. But see, here's the importance too, and, and, and just real briefly on memorization, I stress as we do with our Bible memory passages and stuff, every word being perfect. Because the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we were to start to change God's word, that's not God's word anymore. We've messed it up. It's, it's, it's you know, the, the perfect seed that gets planted in someone's heart is the word of God. That is the seed that goes in, that's sown in the heart. God's word is what does the saving ultimately. God's word is where the new life comes from. If we butcher it and just try to explain a generality of salvation, people aren't going to get saved from that. God's word is what's powerful. It's what's sharper, sharper than any two-edged sword that's able to pierce even the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. God's word has the power. So when we memorize, we make sure that we have every word of God in the right place, in the right order, because that's where the power is. And when we start just, just you know, screwing it up and, and leaving words out or whatever, all of a sudden it no longer becomes... God's Word. So if you, if you do decide to memorize, make sure you know it and just go over it regularly. And to be ready, you know, if you don't use things, especially with memorization, you're going to lose it. Now, I haven't lost any of the scripture I've memorized on salvation. Why? Because I use it multiple times a week all the time. I'm, I'm using these verses all the time. So I'm not going to, and actually that's why I gain more. So the longer I do this, I end up memorizing more verses. That I, that I like to use out soul winning because I'm using it. So to be ready to give the gospel, having a Bible with you, having scripture memorized, 
doing it more, more often is going to help you to be more ready. And one thing I like to point out too, and this has to go back to your heart of being ready and having your heart ready, is giving the gospel even on your mind. Oftentimes, you may find yourself in the perfect opportunity to give the gospel, but the thought never even crosses your mind. And then afterwards, you leave and you go, oh, wow, I, I, probably, I should have given that person the gospel. And it just never even occurred to you while you were sitting there the whole time. If that happens to you, look, we need to change that. It ought to be at the forefront of your Having this desire to, to, to get people saved ought to be one of your number one main focuses in your life. And as I mentioned earlier, we have established time to go out soul winning. We have a set time. But the, goal, the ultimate goal is not just to preach the gospel during these times. The ultimate goal is to be a soul winner all the time. 24 hours a day, you are a living, breathing soul winner for Christ. Fulfilling the role that he really has for us to do, to seek and to save that which is love. It's, it's, it's the most important thing that we can be doing with our, with our time. And that way, if, if this is the mindset that you have, you'll be looking for opportunities. You may be at a gas station, you may be at a grocery store, you may be wherever, but you're thinking, man, there's a lot of people that are lost in this world. The Bible says that, that wide is the gate that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto the life, and few there be that find it. There's few people that are saved. Most people have a tendency to think in America that, well, you know, there's all these different denominations, but they're all Christians and everyone's saved. No. No. There are few that are saved. And it's not because it's difficult, because it's really easy. But it's just because people don't have their faith completely in Christ alone and they're trusting in some form of works. The vast majority of the, of the denominations out there that call themselves Christian are believing in a works-based salvation. But you won't even know that until you start talking to people. So you start bringing up the Bible, start bringing up the gospel, start bringing up, hey, what do you believe about this? We need to be ready. We need to be ready to not have that fear, too, because a lot of times, you know, what's, what's the taboo subject that you're not supposed to talk to anybody about? Religion and politics, right? That's what the world's going to teach you. Hey, don't talk about these things because, you know, you might actually talk about something mean meaningful. And yeah, you know what? You might disagree with somebody. <gasps> I mean, you talk about the weather, there's not much disagreement. It's either raining or it's not. It's either sunny or it's not. You could say, oh, well, well I like the, the breeze. Well, I don't. Okay. You're not going to have any, any problems with that type of a conversation. Now, look, can talk about religion bring uh, quote-unquote problems? Yeah. But do you want to live your whole life not talking about anything that has meaning? Just completely meaningless. Just say, my life is vanity. It means nothing. I'm just going to talk about n things that don't really matter at all. When you can sit there and know in your mind, this person is going to go to hell and burn for an eternity in darkness and be tortured and tormented. Keep that image with you. Maybe that will help you get your, your heart right to say, to have that burning desire in your heart. I need to tell you about Jesus. I need to tell you about Christ. I need to tell you about the free gift of salvation because it's free. I don't care if you get offended because you need to hear this. If you don't receive Christ, you will burn in hell forever. And I don't want to see that happen to you. This is the heart we need to have for people. We need to get ready. We need to be able to, to, to bring this great news to people. And if you haven't done it before, we, get your heart ready. Get your mind ready. Get, you know, start looking at the Bible. Start taking it seriously. Start using your time wisely to prepare. This is why I've done in the past, and I'm going to start them up again. If people are interested, I'll keep doing this. We have the classes that are the soul winning workshops to help you. I want you to be prepared to do this and to help in any way that I can to get you ready to go out and do this. Because there is nothing more important than getting other people saved. There are a lot of important things in life, but the number one thing is, is people's salvation. 
And once you have that settled for yourself, it's our obligation to go out and tell other people how to get saved. Your success in anything that you do has a lot to do with your preparation. The best soul winners are the ones that know their Bibles well because they're able to answer questions because you know sometimes people get hung up on different issues sometimes you talk to someone and they they don't believe that in the deity of Jesus Christ they don't believe that he's God in the flesh because maybe they've been brought up in a, in a, in a cult like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons that teach that that Jesus Christ is just the son of God but he's not really God maybe they have some other issues and you know what the best soul winners are going to be the ones that know the scripture that know the Bible I could say you know what you know let me let me just show you some verses here let me show you this because you're ready because you know the scripture, because you have it memorized, because you have, even if you don't have it memorized, you know the references. You can say, you know what, and, and you, even if you don't know them, you can write for the longest time, and you know, this is an old, or this is a newer Bible. If you look at one of my older Bibles, I have written in the back, where there's just these blank white pages, I have scripture references written down of Jehovah's Witness here, Mormon here, you know, all the, just, just different scenarios. Baptism, here. All the different things that could come up. So, look, as you're growing and as you're learning, I don't expect you just to, to be at this, this superstar level of just having the whole Bible memorized and knowing where everything is. You grow to that point, but in the meantime, be ready. In whatever way you can, write the notes. As you're reading through the Bible, I've done this. In my daily Bible reading, I'll be reading the Bible, you know, looking for stuff, and then if I come across something, hey, you know what, that'd be great for soul. This is a great verse for this. Write it down. Write it down in your Bible. And try to take the same one with you then every time you go out. Or make, you know, make an index card. Something. There's a lot of things that you can do to be prepared. The best soul owners are the ones that know their Bible as well. They go out and talk to people regularly. It's not something that just, just happens once in a blue moon. It's something that they're putting to use on a regular basis. The more you do something, the better you're going to get at it. I don't care what it is. That's the, that's the truth in like any area of life. You, you start to learn something new. Hey, when you do it more repetitively, that's why when, you know, when I was in sports and things like that, you know, we practice every day. Why? Because you know, practice makes perfect. The more you do something, the, more, the better you're going to get at it. And it's true. The more you go out sowing, the better you're going to be at it. The more you talk to people, the better you'll get. And you start off like I did. Start off dropping your Bible, talking to someone at the door, and, and being all embarrassed. Oh, excuse me, you know, and feeling like, like really dumb because you're, you're flustered. But that's not where you stay. If you stick with it, if you don't just quit, you know, you get, you get nervousness, you get butterflies, you're like, all of that stuff gets better and goes away. And you will get better at doing things if you can just not be afraid. And just start to do it out of obedience to God and because your heart is right and because you know that it's the right thing to do. That's what, that's what got me to do. I, I, just, I knew it was right. I could see it in the Bible. I could see it in Scripture. It's plain as day. It makes perfect sense. We need to be doing this. Starts with your heart, but then, but then starting to get ready. And the more you do it, the more experience you gain, the better you're going to get. Going to church consistently is also going to help because you're going to hear a preach, hopefully. You're going to get edified by other people. You're going to see other people doing this. Hey, in announcements, every day we go over, hey, here's where our salvations are at. These are the people that we're reaching. This is what we're doing. I mean, this is one of the main objectives on the first page of our announcements. Because it's so important, because that's the main focus of this church. That's the goal. And then having that sincere love for the lost is that charity in your heart. The best soul winners have a sincere love for, for the lost, for other people. And that's what drives you to go out and preach to God. That's what drives me to take my time and say, you know what, on a Sunday, you know, a lot of times people spend time with their families and do all this other stuff. I'm going to go out and try to win souls. There's a lot of other things I could be doing with my time that could be more pleasing maybe to myself in, in one sense or another. But I'm going to take time out of my day because it is important for those people because, look, I want more people to get saved. When I go out souling, it's not just so like, you say, well, you're the pastor, you just want this church to get, look, that's not the reason. Would I love this church to grow? Absolutely. 
But why? It's because we're trying to help people to do more for God. To serve God more. Not to serve me or anything else. It's, it's to serve God. And the whole point, and you know, why I've been going out soul winning for years and years and years prior to pastoring. It had nothing to do with pastoring. It has to do with it's right, it's obeying God, and I love people, and I want them to get saved. And the more you get out and help other people, God sees that. He'll see your heart. He'll see your spirit. And he's going to be a lot more likely to do things for you also. When you have that loved one, you, you know, when you're praying to God, God, you know, my dad, my brother, my sister, they don't know Christ. And I have this prayer for other family members I have because I'm separated by thousands of miles. I don't always have an opportunity to even talk to people. And even if I do, a lot of times they don't want to hear what I have to say because I'm their family member because they don't take what I have to say seriously. That's another, but you know what? I pray for them anyways. And I pray that God, as I go out and preach to other people's relatives, as I go out and give the gospel to someone else's grandmother or son or daughter or nephew, God, please send someone else to my family. I'm going to help answer prayers over here. Please send someone else to answer my prayers. I know that God's going to be a lot more willing to listen to the prayers of the person who's doing that as opposed to the person who's not. And again, I'm not saying don't pray to God, but if you want to, to really get a hold of God's attention, to, to, to think about the way with my children. If I see them continually doing good for other people and being real generous and helping other people out, I'm a lot more likely to just want to do nice things for them because they have a great heart because they're doing what's right. Hey, you're helping other people out. I love that. I'm going to bless you for that. I'm going to, I'm going to take what you have to say and, and really try my best to, to, to do things for you when you are trying your best to do things for other people. That's the way that God looks at it too. Great way to get a hold of God and just, and just to you know, be the good child. <laughs> Don't be the bad child. Be the good one. When you go to God, just be like, you know, God, I'm having these problems. Can you help me out? The good child's going to be hurt a lot more than the bad child. Turn, if you would, to Luke 12. It's the last place we'll turn this morning. Preach about being prepared. Being prepared. Not just for the gospel. That's probably the most important thing. There's other things we could be prepared for. Here's a real simple one. You come to Wednesday night Bible study. Be prepared by reading ahead. That's the one, the one day that we know what chapter we're going to be in. We know exactly where we're going to be. You come to church, hey, read ahead a little bit. You, I guarantee you'll learn even more when you, when you read the chapter, what it's going to be about, even a few times. And then you come to church and you hear it preached about, you'll walk away with a lot more. I'll read from you from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. The Bible says, But now hath God set the members, talking about the members of a church, every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. Every member in the church has different functions. There's different things for us to do. Um, that whole chapter in 1 Corinthians 12, I'm not going to get into it for sake of time. It talks about, you know, the, the eyes and the hands and the ears and the nose and, you know, not looking with envy over someone else. He's saying, you know, we can't all be eyes. If we're all eyes, then, then how are we going to smell? How are we going to hear? You know, we can't all be noses. How, you know, otherwise, how are you going to see? Not everyone's going to have the same roles in the church. Different members are, are used for different areas. You have different strengths and different gifts and abilities that were given to you by God. But the question is, are you performing your function as a member? You know, if, if you're an eye, so to speak, is your eye just always closed? <laughs> are you just not using it for anything for God? Or just, just is, is, is the church still blind even though you're the eye? Is the church still deaf even though you're the ear? Now take that for whatever your gift is. There's a lot of roles that need to be filled. This church is much, much greater than any one person. Any church is. Or at least it should be. The church exists to do the will of the Lord. Now, obviously the church needs a leader, and, and, and in many churches, you know, the pastor seems to get the most attention and the most focus. But that's just because of the, of the position of the pastor, right? It, it just to be, seems to be the one that's out there more. The same way in our bodies, there's different features that we have that are more prominent. 
but it doesn't mean that they're any more important than other members. Everybody has a lot of value. And there's, I mean, there's churches, there's roles that still need to be filled. For example, we got a piano sitting here and nobody's able to play it. That's a need in our church. There's a, there's a lack. Now look, I know our church isn't very big. We're, we're, still, we're still growing. We're in our infancy stage. But as we grow, and, and you know what? But everyone here, even still, no matter how big we are, everybody has a role that they can fill. Everybody has gifts that God has given them. Are you using them to serve the Lord? And you also have to ask yourself that question. How are you preparing yourself? We're in Luke 12. It's the last place we're going to look. Because this is talking about being prepared for the return of Jesus Christ. Are you prepared when he comes back? Now, there's two ways of looking at this. Obviously, one way of being prepared is just making sure that you're saved. Right? And I think that everyone here has got that taken care of. You're saved. You're prepared in that sense. But we're going to read in Luke chapter 12. We're going to see um, this parable here. And we've read this recently in the past, but uh, we're going to look at it again in, in light of our preparation. Luke 12, look at verse 35. This was Jesus Christ speaking. He says, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding. And when he cometh and knocketh, that they may open unto him immediately. You need to be saying, look, you need to be ready just when he knocks on the door, you need to be there immediately to open. Just be there, ready, right, willing to, to meet him right away. Verse 37, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. It's a great blessing for those that are, that are watching and waiting and are ready. They're prepared. Verse 38, and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even to all? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household? to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But and if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. God requires a lot of us today. We have a lot given to us. We need to make sure that we are ready to do the will of the Lord, that we're ready to do what he has for us. And ultimately, he's going to be coming back. We need to be able to face God when he comes back so you can say, you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Don't you want to be greeted by Jesus Christ of him saying, well done, you did a good job, as opposed to you didn't, you didn't do what I told you to do. And, and the Bible talks here about people being beaten with many stripes. You say, you knew what I told you to do and you didn't do it. And we need to make sure that we're ready. We're prepared. We're ready to serve God. You know, even in this church, I, I, was, you know, I thank God for, for Brother Sebastian who's, who's been very faithful in helping. And, and the reason why I just bring him up is because in my preparation, you know, we've been, we've been getting prepared to have a baby. We've been doing prepared to do these things. And I need to make sure that the church is still going to continue to operate and be prepared. And he's someone that I've been able to rely on that if I'm not here, he's going to be able to step in and fill a role. And we need to be able to look for that. Now, look, I know the ladies aren't going to be able to step up and fill the role of the pastor. That's not your job. It's not your position. That's not what the Bible says. But there are other roles that maybe one person will be able to fill, and when they're not able to, 
you can step in and fill. There's roles that my wife fills that now she's not here, that, that you can step in and fill some of those roles. Okay, and a lot of it can just be simple roles. I mean, talking to, to visitors when they come in, you know, doing just being helpful to people, doing things for other, you know, there, there's a lot of things that we can do as a church in general together. But um, we need to make sure that we're ready. And the biggest thing we need to be ready about is, is giving the gospel. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the edification in your word, dear God. And I pray that you would please just stir up our spirits this morning. God, help us to have our hearts ready to serve you, that we have um, a desire for the loss, a desire just, just to be good children and to serve you, dear God. If we have that desire, dear Lord, it's going to be so much easier to be able to follow through with that then. If we don't have that desire, we're just going to end up doing evil as Rehoboam did, dear God. But I pray that you please help us to get our hearts prepared, but not just stop with the heart and the desire, dear Lord, but follow that through with action, with actually taking a step in, in doing the things that you would have us to do, dear Lord. Help us to know what they are. Help us to, to take the time that's needed and to, to put the pri proper priority in putting time aside and say, you know what, this is important. I'm going to mark up my Bible. I'm going to make sure that I'm, that I'm ready, that I have something with me all the time. I'm going to make sure that I know where to go if I have the opportunity to give the gospel to someone, dear Lord. Help us to, to not just sit here and here and then go home and change nothing. Help us to be able to leave today and to put things into action that we learned, dear Lord, that we wouldn't be forgetful hearers but doer of the work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.